Amen. Amen. All right. So um, by way of recap, last week, we, uh, we talked about the about the Japhethites. I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, in the scriptures, we were told that the, that Japheth migrated to the lands of the north, which belonged to them. When we look at a look on a map, all the lands of the north are in Europe and Russia. Um, to add to that. We looked at a few maps. One of the maps that we looked at was Paul's missionary journey. Excuse me. And Paul's missionary, just to get an idea of, of where uh, Paul went, uh, he said he was the apostle to the Gentiles. Um, and so this is. Paul's missionary journeys. We see he's up in Italy and uh, the lower parts of European areas, Russia, uh, some of the uh, northern parts of Saudi Arabia. We see that very clearly. Uh, this is important because, because Paul said he was the apostle to the Gentiles. And in Genesis chapter 10, verse 5, we read that Japheth was the father of the Gentiles. Okay. And so as to that, so there will be no confusion. Gentiles are only those persons whose lineage comes from Japheth. Okay. So Gentiles are only those persons whose lineage is of Japheth. Did you say uh, Genesis chapter 10, verse 5? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. Yes, ma'am. Not, not every Bible version will use the word Gentiles there. Some of them will say maritime, which means they were sea-dwelling people. Or um, some will say nations. Um, uh, and some will say Gentiles. Uh, and so... Uh, I think I think the evidence that Japheth was uh, was Gentile is in Paul's missionary journeys, and we see what type, what ethnicity these people are, generally speaking, in these areas of the world, um, and so. Um, so Japheth is the father of the Gentiles and uh, no other people group uh, on the planet from a biblical perspective is considered a Gentile, okay? Only the descendants of Japheth. <clears throat> we learned that Japheth had uh, several descendants, uh, Gomer and Magog, who in turn had some children called Ashkenaz, Rephoth, Tagorma, uh, Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, Dodanim, and others. And it says again that by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their land, everyone after his tongue, after their families and their nations. One of the things that we uh, remarked on is um, uh, let me get down here. One of the things that we remarked on was uh, Arthur Kessler's 13th tribe. Arthur Kessler is a European Jew who tried to trace his lineage by blood and was unsuccessful. He uh, demonstrated that their lineage comes from Tagorma, and we know that Tagorma was uh, the father of uh, the Ashke uh, Ashkenaz. Okay, Ashkenaz is the um, the association that's made with European Jews. The 
persons who inhabit Israel today are called Ashkenazi Jews. And by their own terminology, they're pointing to their heritage, they're pointing to where they came from. And they did not come from the line of Shem, they actually came from the line of Japheth. Okay. Um, we also read that the uh, Ashkenazi Jews are descendants of the Khazarian people who occupied the Caucasus Mountains between the Black and Caspian Seas. Give me just a second. My daughter calling me. Bear with me just a second, guys. You guys tracking with me so far? So, uh, so the Ashkenazim people who inhabit Jerusalem are not Semites. So any rhetoric towards them uh, cannot be considered anti-Semitic because they are not Shemitic people. One of the things that we read was Genesis 9, 27, may God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem. That's in Genesis 9, 27. So what we see today is Japheth dwelling in the tents or home place or dwelling place of Shem. Uh, History tells us that Ashkenazi Jews established the state of Israel in 1948, even though they are Japetic and not Semitic people. <clears throat> All right. So tonight we're just going to continue a bit of conversation that we started last week about Shem. It's going to bleed over into some... Um, Let me let me let me let me let me do this a little differently. Do you guys have any questions from what we discussed last week? Is this clear as mud, or you get it all figured out, or you guys are on board? No questions have come up. No challenges about what you discussed with others. No. All right. Very good. Go ahead, Jerry. Nope, you're muted. You're yeah, muted. I, was trying, I was trying to unmute. So this is, because I wasn't here obviously last week and this is probably not something you want to get into right now. I'm just going to, I'm just going to drop the question. Sure. So if, if the whole Israel-Palestine conflict, yeah. this changes that whole dynamic. It does. And so, it also, it also changes the whole mentality of, of what a lot of charismania thought for years that Israel was God's timepiece and, and blah, 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 you know, and, and I'm not discounting all of that. I'm just saying that was like a solid thing. Look to Israel and you know what's going to happen. You know what I mean? And right. so, so since this is not, I don't, I, I'm just, that's rolling around in my head now. It really, really threw me for a loop, the whole Japhetic versus, uh, Semitic thing. So uh, we can talk about that. That's that's where we are. Yeah, so, I just want to drop the question for, for future reference. Certainly. 
the the conflict in the Middle East, uh, as it's called, this is an opinion, right? So I don't have any facts to back this up. This is purely conjecture, although it's conjecture that I think is substantiated in the annals of history. Uh, the reason for the conflict has, I believe, a lot to do with the reality that they realize that the folks who occupy that land aren't supposed to be there. They, there was an Egyptian, an Egyptian uh, president or whatever the modern vernacular they're called now, back in the, back in the 40s, 50s, who made the comment that the Jew left black and returned white. And so there's a lot of conflict over there. And I believe it's centered around the fact that the indigenous people know that the folks who are occupying that land aren't the rightful people to occupy it. But again, that's conjecture. All right, um, you guys bear with me. I'm a little scatterbrained today and, and very much tired. So here's where I think I want to go. Last week, we talked about how the, uh, there's a passage in the, in the um, Apocrypha, 2nd Edris chapter 13, verse 40, that suggests that the Northern Kingdom left by way of the Middle Passage and made their way to uh, what's called Asareth. Asareth, oh, Asareth was the name of, it was the name of America before its discovery. Hmm. Give me a sec. I put discovery in quotes um, because um, and we'll talk about that a little later tonight, uh, what discovery actually means. So Asarath, America, home of the Israelites, this was pulled from uh, somebody's blog who pulled it from the Jewish Encyclopedia Hebrew University Tribes of Original Nations.com. Okay. The name of the land beyond the great river, far away from the habitation of man, in which the ten tribes of Israel will dwell, observing the laws of Moses, until the time of restoration, according to um, Edris 1345, Columbus identified America with this land. See K. Serling's Christopher Columbus, translated by Dr. C. Gross on page 15. Okay. We further talked about who the um, original 10 tribes may have been uh, Reuben, Florida Black Seminole Indians, Gad, Cheyenne, C, uh, Sioux, Apache. Uh, Asher, the Incas, Colombia to Uruguay Indians, uh, Naphtali, Argentina to Chile Indians, Manasseh, Cuban Indians, Simeon is unknown, Issachar, Aztec, uh, Zebulun, Guatemala to Panama, Mayan Indians, Mohawks, and then Ephraim, Arawak, Tayano, Bar, uh, Bar, uh, Bor Boricua Indians. Okay. I put this information out on the groups, and I don't know if everyone's had a chance to look over. Um, if not, uh, or if anyone had any problems opening up anything, um, and so I'll be glad to put it back out there. So the point is, is that JPeth is the father of European nations, 
those European nations, uh, I'm sorry, uh, he had a grandson named Ashkenaz. Ashkenaz was the father of the Khazarians. And the Khazarians are who the modern day Jew has uh, derives from. So they are Jews by way of conversion and not by way of blood, okay? Uh, we read <clears throat> parts of another uh, study called, uh, just a sec, I'll get back to it. I think it was called Gog and Magog. Just half a second, guys. Here we go. This is where we'll pick up today. I'm not going to read the entire document, but I am going to read some of the highlighted portions that you see on the screen. I mentioned that the Khazarians, the Ashkenaz, the Ashkenazim Jews are Jews by way of conversion and not by blood. And so uh, this document here uh, demonstrates how the Khazarian Empire uh, converted to Judaism. So J.B. Burry concurs, there can be no question, he says, that the ruler was actuated by political motives in adopting Judaism. To embrace Mohammedism would have made him the spiritual dependent of the caliphs who attempted to press their faith on the Khazars. And in Christianity lay the danger of his becoming an ecclesiastical vassal of the Roman Empire. Judaism was a reputable religion with sacred books, which both Christian and Mohammedans respected. It elevated him above the heathen barbarians and secured him against the inter interference of the caliphs or the emperor. It would be illogical, however, to think that the Khazarian rulers had embraced Juda uh, Judaism blindly without intimate knowledge of what they were accepting. They had encountered the faith numerous times throughout the preceding century from traders and refugees fleeing persecution at the hands of the Romans and to a lesser degree, Jewish flight from the Arab conquest of Asia Minor. Benjamin Friedman expresses differently the science behind the process of choosing a national Khazarian religion. He claims they were much more informal and random and not nearly so intellectual in their approach. It matters little what the mechanics were of the conversion of the Khazar kingdoms to Judaism. It matters only that it happened and that it happened with a clanging historical ring that resounds to the present age. That makes sense, y'all understanding that? The Khazarians, the Khazarians were in a political pickle, if you will. They needed to choose a religious side they could not choose the caliphs because they would have been subservient to them. And they certainly could not choose uh, Christianity because it would have been subservient to them. But both Christianity and the Mohammedans the, uh, uh, respected Judaism. And so they chose that one, which elevated them immediately uh, to a position that was higher than the two, uh, than the other two. According to an ancient document entitled King Joseph's Reply to Hazdai Ibn Sharprut, Joseph, a latter Khazarian king, stated that from that time on the Almighty God helped him, that is King Gulan, and strengthened him. He had his slaves circumcised themselves, and he sent for and brought wise men of Israel who, who interpreted the Torah for him and arrange the precepts in order, okay? So uh, the king, the then king of Khazar, uh, talked with other Jews 
to make sure he had all of the religious rites down to include circumcision, uh, which he did uh, cause everyone that was under his authority to receive, every male to receive. Uh, um, Lewis, what are precepts? A precept is a, is a law or rule that was given in the past. So um, one of the rules of the, I can't remember the kingdom, I think it was uh, the Persians or the Medes, it, when the king said something uh, that was law and it was binding forever, regardless of if it was right or wrong. <laughs> uh, okay. I'm gonna start reading here. There appears to be as many historical accounts as how King Balan was converted to Judaism as there are historians and mystics to present them. Many of them involve visions of angels, such as the tale by a Sephardic Jewish philosopher detailing a dream in which an angel told the king that his intentions are desirable to the creator, but the continued observance of shamanism was not. In the aforementioned document, King Joseph's reply to its author claims that in that same dream, God promised King Balan that if he would abandon his pagan religion and worship the only true God, that he would bless and multiply Balan's offspring and deliver his enemies into his hands and make his kingdom the last, the la kingdom last to the end of the world. It is believed by scholars that the dream was designed to stimulate the covenant in Genesis and meant to imply that Khazarians too claim status of a chosen race uh, who made their own covenant with the Lord, even though they were not descendants of Abraham's seed. So a lot of thinking went into the conversion of the Khazarian people to Judaism, even so much to adopt that they were a chosen race by God by way of this dream that may or may not have actually occurred. The entrenchment in the Jewish religion outlasted the kingdom itself and was transplanted whole cloth into the Eastern European settlements of Russia and Poland. All right. The term diaspora simply means the scattering. Uh, this more recent, I'm reading here in this paragraph that's highlighted. This more recent diaspora resulted in a strong, oftentimes politically overwhelming Khazar Jewish influence in especially Hungary and Poland, but also in the whole of Eastern Europe. Jews were found in positions of power and political influence in virtually every major category of life, business and society. There may have already been a small population of what Kessler calls real Jews living in that region, but there can be little doubt that the majority of modern Jewry originated in the uh, migratory waves of Khazars who play such a dominant part in early Hungarian history. Western European Jews historically disp displayed such a talent and acumen at trading and as usurers, that is money lenders, that in virtually any society and culture in which they found themselves, they became the possessors of and controlling influence over large portions of that nation's wealth. Y'all familiar with the Rothschilds or Rothschild as it's properly called? Uh, so the Rothschilds are Ashkenazim Jews. These 0.0001 percenters own the money. They own all the media, entertainment, news. They own all of it. So it's no surprise that we see in this document that they became the possessors of and controlling influence over that nation's wealth. Uh, 
by the way, the Federal Reserve is not federal at all. It is a privately owned bank and it's owned by the Federal Reserve Banking System, which is under the control of the Rothschilds. Just FYI. Abraham N. Poliak, Tel Aviv University's post-war professor of medieval Jewish history, wondered at how far we can go in reading this, that is Khazar Jewry, as the nucleus of the large Jewish settlement in Eastern Europe. The descendants of this settlement, Polak declares, those who stayed uh, where they were, those who immigrated to the United States and to other countries, and those who went to Israel, constitute now the large majority of the world of world Jewry. So uh, this uh, Ashkenazim Jewish professor is declaring that what now makes up the majority of world Jewry was birthed, if you will, or came out of Eastern Europe. Okay. Now I mentioned this because uh, in the in the weeks to come, we're going to be transitioning into Shem and talking about the identity of Shemites, and then subsequently the children of Israel, and uh, and then uh, how that applies to to us people of color in uh, in the Americas. Okay. <clears throat> So right now, the large majority of world jewelry came out of Eastern Europe, and those are the ones who exist in the Jewish settlements and other places around the world. The evidence I'm reading right here that's highlighted, the evidence uh, Mr. Kessler nicely summates adds up to a strong case in favor of those modern historians whether Austrian, Israeli, or Polish, who independently from each other have argued that the bulk of modern Jewry is not of Palestinian, but of Caucasian origin. Uh, you guys familiar with Henry Ford? Henry Ford uh, developed the Ford automobile. Uh, he commissioned a four volume a four volume uh, publication entitled The Modern Jew, The World's Foremost Problem. And in that publication, he takes writings from Kessler and from some others uh, to, uh, to document that the modern Jew is not of Abraham's, uh, not of Abrahamic descent. With the, with the overwhelming evidence that the modern Jewish population is of Khazarian origin, Kessler remarks that this would clearly indicate that their ancestors came not from the Jordan, but from the Volga, not from Canaan, but from the Caucasus, once believed the cradle of the Aryan race, and that genetically they are more closely related to the Uyghur and the Magariar tribes than to the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This conclusion would then logically render the epithet anti-Semitism void of meaning, Kostler says. The later conclusion is a position Palestinian Arabs may well dispute with Mr. Kostler due to the fact that this revelation ironically places the modern Jew currently occupying Palestine in the unenviable position of themselves being anti-Semitic and historical mockery of somewhat amazing proportion. So yeah, <clears throat> the fact is, is that they are the ones who are in fact anti-Semitic. Mm. All right. Later, some of the Sephardic Jews of Spain immigrated northward, accounting for some of the smaller Jewish populations in Western Europe. Because of the long and varied history of the Jews, says the 2001 edition of the World Book Encyclopedia, it is difficult to define a Jew. There is no such thing as a Jewish race. Jewish identity is a mixture of religious, historical, and ethnic factors. Thus, 
those who might have truly claimed to be the genealogy of Abraham and of true Semitic origin became extinct as a discernible race being replaced by the white Khazars of the uh, Transcaucasus, uh, none of whose ancestors, as Benjamin Friedman phrases it, have ever placed a foot in the land of Palestine. So in the next few weeks, we're going to demonstrate that there is a discernible race of the uh, Jew, Jew uh, of the Hebrew people, and that those people uh, exist uh, scattered across the world, as Jesus said they would, and have landed in places uh, such as uh, South, Central America, Mexico, and North America. Okay, Lewis, I have a question just to make sure I understand. So you have the original Jew. Yep. And then this is saying there is no Jewish race. So, so that's two separate things, right? Uh, so two things. Okay. First thing. There is probably a uh, academic definition for the word Jewish. When I see Jewish, particularly when I see the letters ISH, I immediately think like, but not quite. Okay, that's what I think too. Okay, okay. so no, we're not called blackish or Negro-ish or African-American-ish. No one puts ish whitish, Caucasian-ish, Mexican-ish. Mm -hmm. No one says that about any other group of people except for Jews. And I think that's important because that in itself is declaring that these folks are not who they say they are. Okay. And that's what I'm thinking. Like, I'm, when I'm reading this and it's saying, you know, according to the World Book of Encyclopedia, it's the, difficult to define a Jew but then it says there is no such thing as a Jewish race. So, and so here's the second thing. So okay. uh, race in zoological terms is a subgroup of a species whose defining characteristics are absolute. Okay. And okay. so with that in mind, there is no such thing as race. There is no people group on the face of the earth that, uh, that can fit that definition. I read, I'll repeat it again. Of uh, absolute, okay. Absolutes, right? So there okay. are no absolute races, right? Mm -hmm. So Abraham um, had a child of an Egyptian woman whose name is Ishmael, right? And then mm -hmm. uh, uh, we have we have the twelve tribes of Israel, Judah in particular, who uh, had children from Egyptian women. And we see this mixture of, uh, of Hebrews and Hamites all throughout scripture. So there is no, uh, there is no, there is no Jew Hebrew race in the sense that it's all completely Abrahamic blood, right? Okay. So in well, that okay. sense, so in so that sense, it doesn't question. exist. I'll go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was saying in that sense, it doesn't exist, but there is a Jew, there is an Hebrew, a Hebrew identity. There is a Hebrew, uh, uh, there is Hebrew blood, and there are people who, who, who are on the face of the earth today who have Hebrew blood coursing through their veins. Those okay. persons uh, were taken, um, in large part, they were taken off of the shores of the continent of Africa the land of Ham, and they were scattered throughout the Americas. Okay, makes sense. My other part would be, so if we say there's no race, right? right. So we've accepted an identity that people have said, like, hey, you're the Black race, right? Yeah, right. So, so so truly, we're not, and my, me and my cousin kind of go back and forth, but she's like, we're not Black. You know, that was just the name that they gave us. So she, she said this before. So when, when I hear you say that, so we technically don't have races. It's just something man, maybe man-made that to classify different people. Is that so, what it is? So race was created 
in the mid 15th century as a way to classify people who were not Christians. Christians, let me put that in quotes. Okay. It was, it was, it was created by the papacy, the Pope, the Roman church, the quote, Holy See, as a way to differentiate Christians from everybody else. It is a political term used to divide people and put persons in categories. The best word to use is the word ethnicity. Okay. Which I've never looked at up like the roots of these words. So, right. okay, so this gives me a good start. Okay, thank you. So um, as an ethnicity, uh, there are Hebrews, they are not extinct and they are discernible. So I think this would be a good time to kind of connect some dots. Okay. We started off by talking about the creation of humanity, creation of, of man, right? And we discovered that uh, wet dirt, which we call mud, was formed in the hands of God to create Adam. And the scripture says that Adam was, was created in the image of God and after his likeness. We further discussed that image has to do with appearance. And because image has to do with appearance, I asked the question, in your experience, what is the color of mud? In your experience, okay? That is the color of God. Appearance. And then it says that he created him after his likeness, which has, which has to do with his power and authority. And then we see in Genesis 2, verse 7, that he gave man and woman authority, gave them dominion, gave them power. Uh, oh, as a side note, he did not give dominion, authority, and power to the man. All right. He didn't do that. He gave it to the man and the woman. He gave it to them. You read that, not him, in your Bible. T-H-E-M, not H-I-M. So the two of them together is what creates this powerhouse of dominion and power in the earth. We went on to discover uh, that uh, Eden is situated in the hot part of the earth by way of uh, of cultural writings of Kushites or Ethiopians uh, in the area and other places. And we've discovered that Eden is or in Africa and that's where man was created. So, so already we're, the, the, the dots that I want you to see connecting is that uh, the Bible is very much Afrocentric and not Eurocentric. Hey, Lewis, quick question for you. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. So um, I have a question and statement. So as we go through this, uh, as you unpackage the um, lecture series, you know, we're kind of supposed we're, we're doing two things in once. We're kind of wrapping our brains around the content and and we should be kind of listening in a way that to help shape it. And I guess maybe that's a conversation for, um, you know, at the conclusion, you know, how can we shape it um, as we pr prepare to present it to the world type of thing. Um, but one of the things that we want to try to do is as, as with what you did with um, um, another fact that you weren't able to prove oh, yeah. um, do dogmatically to say, Hey, this is what this is just kind of steer away from it. Um, it sounds as if I hear you say that, and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you're saying Yeshua as far as Jesus, the Christ, or if you're saying God, um, this is the color of God in his image now because, and I've heard it a couple of weeks in a row, um, it is more widely accepted. We know scripture says God is a spirit and that it talks about image of God. Um, it's because being God, being a spirit, God does not have 
there, there are some theological terms, uh, theophany or anthropomorphic manifestations or theophany, the hands of God, the feet of God, the mouth of God, things of that nature. Sure. We know that when, when the Bible speaks to us in those terms, the hands of God, the feet of God, the mouth of God, that it is symbolism that we as human beings understand. Okay. So I think, um, I don't know that we want to say that God was black. It sounds like that's what we're, that, that's what we're saying. I don't, I don't know. I don't know that we want to say that God was black. Um, I, you know, I think all the dots connect to the first man being black, but I think in the image of God, it has more to do with, um, our ability to um, think, our ability to uh, to create, our ability to. So when you look at the image of God, it's more widely accepted in in that sphere as opposed to a black God creating the universe. And I don't I don't know that there is enough for us to that we even want to venture into those waters. That's that's my my thoughts on that. I don't right. teach that. I don't teach. I don't teach that. Right. And I think it's a safe space. I think we have enough um, ammunition without venturing into those waters. Um, if you were to say Yeshua, the manifestation of 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 the the Son of God here on Earth, I'm with you 110. Uh, percent But to assign a color. To God, I'm, I I don't think that's that's what we want to do. So two things. Does that make sense? It does. So two things. First thing, uh, thank you for making that differentiation because the scripture makes it very clear that it was the second person of the Trinity who did all the creation, right? So uh, so it was in fact the Messiah who did who did all the creative work. Uh, that is found in Philippians uh, chapter, I think it's chapter one, verse 16, by him, all, uh, he created all things, by him all things consist, uh, Philippians 1, 16. And so, yes, you are correct. And also uh, the scripture makes it very clear that uh, that the father is, uh, is invisible uh, in as much as uh, that seeing him is the same as seeing the wind so so though so so yes i understand what you're saying and i will be careful uh in the future uh, or careful going forward um that said i image image has a definition and an image is not subject to our interpretation so image means appearance and re regardless of how that might make us feel um, about accepted theology image has a definition and it means something or it means nothing and so he says he was man was created in in the image of god i am okay with the reality that that word god there is talking about the godhead the total sum total of God and the person and the person of the Messiah. Um, so um, while I want to be careful not to apply any conjecture, as you have uh, rightly mentioned, I also don't want to to lose something along the way uh, or misunderstand something along the way that could provide insight. But you're right, we have enough data that we don't need to go, go there to begin with. So um, the, the people that God made, and uh, so this is where I was going. <clears throat> the first, I mentioned that the Bible is Afrocentric and not Eurocentric. The first world leader was black. So the scripture says uh, that Nimrod uh, was uh, the whole world was under one language, and Nimrod had the entire world together, uh, and they built a tower. So Nimrod is the grandson of Ham. Ham is the progenitor of the Black races, according to Zondervan Dictionary, not the Negroes. 
Ham is the progenitor of the black races, of the dark races, excuse me, not black. It doesn't use the word black, it uses the word dark. Ham is a progenitor of the dark races, not the Negro, okay? Uh, and so uh, Ham had a son named Cush, and Cush had a son named Nimrod, and Nimrod was a world leader. It was, and, and until then, the whole world spoke one language, and he had the whole world together to build a tower. So... Where I'm going with all of this is that it's only been in the last 2000 years that there has been a flipping, a switching of what and who Hebrews look like and what and who the first man and woman look like. Now, we're not we're not confused about the fact that it's been switched uh, because uh when we look, when we remember the Ten Commandments and Charlton Heston, who played Moses, he was, uh, he was, he did not, he was blue eyed. Mm. Right? He had blonde hair. <laughs> okay. Right. And then you see the persons who were playing Egyptians, yet Yul Brenner, right? Who, I don't know if his eyes were blue. I think they were. Um, but in both of them, their complexion was uh, was not the complexion of people indigenous to a land that is remarkably hot. Okay, and so society has trained our minds, has conditioned our minds to whenever we think Egyptian, for some reason, we're supposed to immediately think of people like Jerry, who I love. Think of people like Jerry instead of people like you and I. We've been conditioned that way for centuries, not centuries, for decades. We've been conditioned. And uh, the other thing, um, it's 757. So we've been conditioned to think of, uh, of I, I, did some, I did some research because I was truly genuinely curious. I wanted to know the number of uh, cases of melanoma among, uh, among black people as compared to white people, right? So I went to the source or the authority of cancer, the American Cancer Society, and I said, hey, American Cancer Society, tell me the ratio of blacks to whites for melanoma, skin cancer. And they told me it's almost none. It's so little, in fact, that they don't even keep track of it. And society wants me to believe that the people who are indigenous to the hottest place on the planet can have skin that doesn't look like ours and not die from melanoma, skin cancer. You see, two plus two don't equal four in that equation, okay? The other thing that we discovered is that Ham had uh, four boys, Cush, Foot, Mizraim, and Canaan, okay? These are all the descendants of Ham. Ham is the, uh, uh, the progenitor of the dark races. He him and his people occupy the land of Africa, okay? So in Genesis chapter 10, what you are reading and reviewing is the table of nations, as your Bible may say that at the heading of Genesis 10. The nation of Ham, the nation of Ham um, is Africa, modern day like vernacular, and Ham's youngest boy, one of Ham's boys, I don't know if he was oldest or youngest, but one of Ham's boys was named Canaan. And the land of Canaan is the land that God promised to people, Abraham. Abraham, that, that land stretched out over there, that belongs to you. That's the land of Canaan. That's yours. Now, Canaan is in Africa. And I'll say again, the land of Africa 
is some of the hottest parts of the planet, of the, of the earth. And it's just not biologically conceivable that people who do not have melanated complexion can survive there. They cannot survive there. They cannot survive there. And so God would be, would be a terrible God if he said, hey, listen, you guys go and occupy, you white folks, go over there and occupy the land of Canaan. Yeah, yeah, the sun's going to burn you up. Yeah, yep, yeah, you're going to die of cancer. Yep, yep, but go get it. That's yours. So God, God, God didn't do that. He put people in that land who had a complexion that could be able to endure the climate that um, that, that 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 specific climate. Not all people groups of the earth can endure that climate. We got people groups in Texas who can't endure this climate. Getting skin cancer every year. Every year getting skin cancer. Every year. So why would we think that people who don't have a specific complexion can endure in the land of Africa? Why would God put people who are not bodily constituted to live in the land of Africa in the land of Africa? Well, the answer is real simple. He wouldn't do that. He wouldn't do that. <clears throat> it's 801. Next week, we're going to start talking about Shem. So I've made the comment a few times, and um, I'm not sure if it was picked up, but Zondervan Bible Dictionary, what a very well-respected Bible publication distribution company, Zondervan, uh, has said in their dictionary uh, that, uh, that Ham is the progenitor of the dark races, not the Negro. And I scratched my head the first time I read that. I said, that's how they who, huh? Yeah, you see, Ham is the progenitor of the dark races, uh, not the Negro. I'll just show this to you. Hold on. La, da, 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 da. So Ham is the progenitor of the dark races, not the Negro. Can y'all see that? We're gonna make that bigger. Not the Negroes, but the Egyptians, Ethiopians, Libyans, and Canaanites. Let me ask y'all a question. Isn't that because Negro is not, it's not, that was something that came up along later, um, a name to use later in history. I understand your question. And it would, it could be seen that way. But what if the scholars and professors and the group of, of anthropologists and such that were under Zondervan's employ realize uh, something about etymology and that the word Negro uh, does not mean black people. What was, what was Angela's question? I'm sorry, Matthew had me distracted. What was that question? It's all good. She asked if whether or not Negro appears here in this definition because it's a modern word and Zondervan's a modern company. They were using this word but, uh, uh Right, the, like it says, it's not the dark races, not the Negroes. Negro is a term that I think that didn't it sort of come around in America during slavery or a little bit later on or yeah. early on. Um, it was not a, it's not a, it's really not an ethnic, it's not an ethnic group. Well, well, so, uh, Go ahead, go ahead, Lewis. I think I know what you, what you get because it was it was on the maps, Negro Land maps, and so I saw that I Negro think, Land maps, but that was the mapping of a British, uh, wasn't it a British uh, captain or something who was chartering, who was doing the charts, and so it was a term that they used to identify, and maybe they just mispronounced the 
can I give you can I give you something real quick? Because I it's eight oh five. So can I just say something real quick here. Uh, go ahead. Being bilingual, uh, I mean, just the root of the word is the Latin word which describes the color black. So, and to my understanding, it was first used by the Portuguese discoverers, Spanish discoverers, to identify the color of people, the skin color of the people they saw. Well, let's just test that thought. It's a great thought. Let's see if that. Let's see if that rings true. What am I looking for? This is what I'm looking for. Latin is Niger, which is interesting because that's also a river name over in that whole area over there. Huh? That's right. Talking. Okay. And a um, publication written in the uh, in the 1600s. I'm I'm gonna read the highlighted portion of this. <laughs> Uh, here on the right side. Hmm. Gonzalez was the first Portuguese who in 1492 returned with Negro slaves purchased instead of the Africans. Hmm. Y'all see that? Wow. Mm -hmm. Yes. He preferred Negroes over Africans. Hmm. So where'd he get them from? They got them from Africa. Hmm. Show sure enough did. Mm. And that, that concludes tonight's session as we prepare mm -hmm. for next that's, week's session. That's 1442, by the way, uh, Lewis. Yeah, it was 1442 on that thing. It was 1440. It was 1442. Um, this is an account of what happened in 1442. The publication wasn't written in 1442. No, that's not. You said 1492. That was Columbus. You, you just got, you misread the number. That's all right. Oh, 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 thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I said 1492. Boy, that's messed up. But the, but the type was small, and you're getting old, so it's good. <laughs> <laughs> so that, so that, so that publication said that he went to Africa, and he returned with Negroes instead of Africans. So that could have been from Negro land, like we saw on the map. Mm. How they pronounced Hebrew, it. They were Hebrews. Mm. They were Hebrews. So Negro... Negro is a uh, came out of the word Hebrew. Negro, Hebo, um, uh, uh, Negro, Hebo, Igbo. I'm sorry, Hebo, Negro, Igbo, Hebo, Negro. Negro comes out of the word Hebrew. Okay. Hey, let, let, me, let me read this quick paragraph. This goes back to, uh, and tell me if you disagree with this, uh, y'all. Um, it says, it says, why are we called Jews? This is written by the, this is written by the Jews, um, uh, world union for progressive Judaism. We were once called Hebrews during the time of Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, and Rebecca. After Jacob got his name changed to Israel and moved to Egypt, there were, the people were called Israelites. This continued for the entire biblical period until Rome ruled over an area called Judea when we were called Judeans. There were a few instances of the word Yehidin Jews in the book of Esther, but not enough to make historical reality. Um, and so, and so they're trying to explain this Jewish idiom. Yeah, this Jewish name. Yeah. Interesting. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. So my understanding is that Jew was short for Judah. They were the only ones that were left because remember the northern tribe was taken to captivity into Assyria. The, su the southern tribe, Judah and Benjamin, were taken to captivity into Babylon. But that kingdom of Babylon or that, uh, sorry, the, the, the Southern Kingdom was able to uh, continue because of the uh, turnover of leadership in that area of the world. So Babylon yielded to the Persia Medes, to, to the Medes, who yielded to the Greeks, who yielded to the Romans, right? And so Jew is just a short form of Judah or Ju <laughs> Ju Judeans. 
Uh, Hugh Dan's, Hugh Dan's. So wouldn't it make wouldn't it make more sense, Lewis, if they were okay? So you got Northern Kingdom, you got Southern Kingdom. Wouldn't it make more sense? You know, they're really trying to hold on to the Southern Kingdom, and that's the reason Southern Kingdom of Judah. Yes, but wouldn't it make more sense? Because it seems like in, in recent times there are some scholars that are more open to the idea of the Northern Kingdom, uh, the Middle Passage, and um, Native Americans, so and so, so, so and so forth. You know, why are they determined, maybe you can explain it for the group in, in 60 seconds or less, why are they determined to hold on to the Southern Kingdom? Why was, why were the people of God? Why are the Jewish people, the Jew, the, the Jew, um, uh, Israel, as we know it today, why are they so determined to hold on to the identity that to identify themselves more so with the southern kingdom of Judah than any of the other because, than the northern kingdom of Israel? Because Judah is where the Lord sprang from. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's what they want to identify with. That's what they want. And if they have, if they give up that real estate. Yeah. All bets are off. All bets are off. Yeah. Wow. That's why. All right, y'all. It's 11 after the hour. Any other questions? <laughs> Calandra, you've been awful quiet. And I'm not picking on you. You just quiet. Oh, my mind is just. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of information. Yeah. Well, tell me what you're thinking. Um, I think Tanika asked something uh, kind of like this last week, and I'm not going to say that I'm going to be devil's advocate. I'm not going to be devil's be the advocate. advocate. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, but if we going to, if we're going to, you know, teach this to the masses, I just have to think. I'm kind of like thinking how some people may be thinking. Um, and so my question is. Why does it matter? Oh, that's a great Hold on. Question. Let me finish. Let me finish. Okay. All right. Why does it matter? Because why does all this matter? Why does it matter where we came from? Why does it matter? Why does it matter? And on that great day when Jesus returns, it doesn't matter what color you are. It's not going to matter what color you are. We can't go back and change the past, right? We can't go back and change what has happened to people of color or brown people or black people. We can't change that. So my question is, what does it matter? Uh, and I know, I, I kind of know, but I wanna, I, you know, we're gonna teach this to the masses. People are gonna ask this, why does that matter? You know, when God comes back, we're all gonna be one big family, right? <laughs> so. Break that down for me. And I think Tanika asked this a little bit last week, but I just want a little bit more detail. Hey, hey, Lewis, can can I answer from Limitless Church and you answer from kind of a global thing? Sure. Can I do that? All right. All right. So because Tanika did ask the question as far as the church, how you know, how how would we posture ourselves? And, you know, and here's the deal. It matters. And, and this isn't something, this wasn't a knee-jerk reaction type thing, y'all. This was um, much prayer, much deliberation, and many conversations. I mean, I dare to say hundreds, if not thousands, of conversations between Lewis and I over a period of time. Right. And it matters. I asked myself that same question, uh, Calandria. Why does it matter? Then I said to myself, self, if it didn't matter, they wouldn't have changed it. Bing, Number one. If it didn't matter, they wouldn't have changed it because what you, what's what's happened is there is a, a history of a people um, that if they want it, they'll take it. If they want an identity, they'll take it. If they want a land that is ripe with resources and oil and diamond, they'll take it. And, and if they want the promise, I mean, we, we love this Bible story, but 
that's not us, but we, we want that to be us. And, and we can't allow the people that we're trying to oppress to identify with this. When they read this promise, they need to see us or else they're not going to stay subservient to us. They're not going to stay subservient. It's going to be hard for them to, to, to follow us and to submit to us if they see themselves um, as they really are. So, so that's, 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 that's the first thing. The second thing is this conversation has to happen in order to usher in the return of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Facts. Okay. So, because there's going to be a gathering, right? And right now there's a great awakening that's taking place all over the world. And, and I, I didn't know anything about this, but as, as we began to put all these pieces of puzzle together and I'm listening to Lewis and I'm, and there's, and there's, there's a rhythm that I'm hearing in, in Africa. Africa is waking up right now. Africa is waking up right now. There's, there's an awakening and people are, and not only that, I have a video. I, I, I'm going to share it with Lewis first, but it's a Jewish rabbi and it will shake you to the core. Mm. It will shake you to the core of, of what he said. It's a Jewish rabbi. And if you get, if you guys get that video, please watch it because everything that's being taught tonight, he's saying it. Now the, the thing that I, that he stopped short of doing, but what he's saying is yes, black people, you are Israelite but we are your Israelite brothers. Don't, don't turn against us. Don't fight us. Work with us. And, and he's quotes that if you get a chance, go back and look at Zephaniah chapter three. And it talks about the promise and how that we're all going to be a people moving back to, uh, to usher in the, the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, a people of one language. And that, and that's, that's Hebrew. And so, because at some point, Lewis, oftentimes, Lewis will use words like, um, um, if you notice, um, he'll, he'll say Yeshua, I'll say Jesus, Jesus. The only reason why I say Jesus is because I tell him that I have to move the congregation to a place, right? I'll say God. He'll say, um, Yehovah. say that again. Yehovah. Yehovah uh, Elohim. Elohim. Yeah, Yehovah Elohim. He'll say Yehovah Elohim, and I'll say, well, and I'll tell him this. Hey, when you stand before the people, I need you right now. I need you to say God. I need you to say Jesus. I need you to say Lord. Although Lord, the name Lord is really assigned to Baal. If you if you really if you really look at it, it's it's really it's really assigned to Baal. So, um, but there's an awakening, and. As we move to the place that we all call upon the name of Yeshua, okay, we're moving to that one language. We're moving to the place that we we uh, we call upon the name of the Lord, um, and He said, and He has a name. He has a name. He has a name. Yeah. And what they've done is they they knew the power. Of, of because I believe that if we call upon his name, that something will stir in the people of God and, and an awakening would begin to take place. And that's going on right now. So as Limitless Church, we said we're going to be the, um, the house of truth built. We're just going to tell the truth and we're going to tell the, 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 the people. And I, and I was at a different place several months ago and I am today. I firmly believe that um, those Africans, those black um, people that were traded in the slave trade, I firmly believe that that was the Southern Kingdom of Judah. I firmly believe every every, every I believe that I believe that um, they are that we are all. If if you are directly connected um, by by one of your ancestors, slave trade, that you have Israelite blood running through you. Facts. Okay. They know that. And we've got to tell the truth and expose the enemy. All right. And it, and, and it goes a little bit deeper. So so then why then if, if, if you know, so, yeah, yeah. So that's why we were looking at them cross eyed when they said, hey, come get this vaccine shot. When have you ever told us the truth? When have you ever wanted what was best for us? But now you want to save our lives? 
Huh. When did that start? So, so anyway, um, you know, we want to be a distributor of truth. And that's really what our focus is, uh, Calandria, uh, as a church. Now, um, and to liberate people and to cause people to think better, people of color, to think better of themselves, to know who they really are. Okay. Um, we have been so Euro, Eurocentric theology to death that we have forgotten. We, they, they own, they have taken ownership of the Bible. And it's, and it's our story. Jerry and his people have taken ownership <laughs> of the Bible. Listen, they stopped being my people a long time ago. <laughs> Uh, at least 10 years ago. <laughs> Most of them don't speak to me anymore. Some are in my own family. <laughs> so, they, so they just, they disown you. So Lewis, did you want to add to that before you conclude? Yeah, I just want to, <laughs> I want to read something here. Uh, the question was, the question was, why does it matter? Uh, first thing, it should matter because you are not who they have told you your entire life your parents and grandparents and great grandparents entire life, you're not the person that they have painted you to be. That's not who you are, okay? White Christianity suffers from a bad case of Disney princess theology. As each individual reads scripture, they see themselves as a princess in every story. They are <laughs> Esther, never Xerxes or Haman. They are- Where'd Peter, you get that from? Never Jews. I got that from Jerry. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> no. They are Esther, never Xerxes or Haman. They are Peter, never Judas. They are the woman anointing Jesus, never the Pharisee. They are the <laughs> Jews escaping slavery, never Egypt. For citizens of the most powerful country in the world who enslaved both Native and Black people, to see itself as Israel and not Egypt when studying the scripture is a perfect example of Disney princess theology. And it means that as people in power, they have no lens for locating themselves rightly in scripture or society. And it has made them blind and utterly ill-equipped to engage issues of power and injustice. It is some very weak Bible work by Erna Kim Hackett. Yep. The reality is this here, until you know, Second Chronicles 714, that was penned by in Hebrew, written for Hebrews, said this here, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then you can put whatever you want after then you are not going to receive what's on the other side of then until you recognize who you are he said if my people he said if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and yes while there is application that can be made to the church and the world today it was not written for the church. It was written for the Hebrew of God. And he said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, what you want after then? That's yours. But if you don't recognize yourself as his people, you'll never pray that prayer. You'll never seek him earnestly. And by you, I mean the, the general you, not you, Calandria. Uh, Could I say one thing, Lewis? Go ahead. Um, it, it, it matters to me. And I'll tell you why. I, not a lot of people know this. Lewis knows this, and the worship team knows this. I have recently had an opportunity to leave Limitless Church to work at another church. <clears throat> it's just the last week, actually, um, for a substantial increase in monetary income. And I mulled it over because um, I lost some income in the last month that I'd had it for a year 
and I lost a contract. And so I mulled it over, but I woke up. I don't remember what day it was, but I told Lewis I woke up and my peace meter, and y'all pardon my French, but my peace meter was like, hell no. I just, it was no, I know there was a no and a no and a no. And part of the reason it matters is because there's a reason I'm at Limitless Church. I'm not there by, it's just not happenstance that I'm there at this particular point in time. Um, I need I need to know who you are. The other part of that- That helps me know who I am. Exactly. And the other part of that, Calandria, is we run the risk of misinterpreting prophecy because we have applied things to a people to which it does not belong. Mm -hmm. Like for instance, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, like, for instance, when we look at somebody brought this up, uh, Lewis was reading that article and he said uh, uh, the Rothschilds and uh, the, the, their, yes. yeah, their, their ability to businessmen and women, so on and so forth. Right. So so what we've done is we've allowed and, and, and Jews are very um, the Jewish people in America have been very uh, heavy handed in their business dealings too. business. Well, <laughs> and, and it goes beyond true. They've also been very heavy handed in their in their business dealings, too. And and we've given them a pass because of that. Our interpretation of the promise promise that you see, you see, we, oh, oh, that that that's supposed to be. They're supposed to be prosperous. They're supposed to be this. Suppose that. And then what we've done is we've looked at. But look at all the hell we've gone through as a people. That's favor. Okay, you you might say, well, look, we're still here. They've done everything they could to exterminate black people. Exterminate, like get rid of. You understand? They've released because they knew they've released AIDS and Ebola and all that over there in Africa and different things. They've done that. That so <laughs> we're still here. We're still standing, right? And so that's a favored people. That's a that's a people that are covered by the grace of God or the favor of God. Um, Amen. And if we know who we are, like Lewis said, we can claim those promises. When we read the Bible, you'll read it different. I promise if you if you don't allow the fear that tried to keep me from even ex, ex, accepting this truth, if you don't allow that fear to overtake you, I promise you, you're going to read the Bible differently the next time you read it. Because the next time you read it, you're going to be reading it as this is me. That's me. That's my promise. That's for me. <laughs> that, that one right there, that one's mine. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Amen. Um, I don't think it will, it's not necessarily part of this, of, of the sessions. Not necessarily. Um, but uh, Pastor, you mentioned they've done their dead level best to eradicate black people and we're still here. Um, but there was an eradication that did occur and it was very, very successful. Okay. Um, I've heard both sides that the Willie Lynch letters are, uh, are both fiction and truth. But the the the, the, the the truths that are spoken in these letters um, lead me to believe that this is more fact than fiction. I, I want to read just a small portion of this. It doesn't have any, any language in it, this portion here anyway. William Lynch, The Untold Story, 1712. In my bag here, he says, hold on, let's see here. You just look at it yourself. Yeah. Um, in my bag here, I have a foolproof method for controlling your black slaves. I guarantee every one of you that if it is installed correctly, it will control the slaves for at least 300 years. My, sim my method is simple. Any member of your family or your overseer can use it. I have outlined a number of differences among the slaves, and I take these differences to make them bigger. I use fear, distrust, envy for control purposes. These methods have worked on my modest plantation in the West Indies, and it will work throughout the South. Take the simple little list of differences and think about them. 
I won't show you any more computer studio on. I won't show you any more because from here it gets to be uh, computer <laughs> studio on. But in this, in this letter, he tells you how to break the minds of, of people. In this case, it's directed toward us, the minds of black people. He, de he declared that it will control the slaves for at least 300 years. And here we are on the opposite end of chains and whips, and we still have a slave mentality. Um, I don't mind sending this to whoever. It's, I bought it off, off the web. I freely give it to anyone who wants to read it. It's remarkable how as he goes through his list of things to do to break the psychology of a man and a woman and a family, and you can see this that has happened among no other people group on earth. And you compare and contrast that to Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 16, where God says, listen, if you don't uh, obey me, this is the promise of cursings that I'm going to give to you. And you read what he says to do to break people and you compare that to the pages of scripture and you realize, mm, God wasn't playing. No other people group on the planet, everybody wants to identify with all the promises of God. Well, on the opposite side of that promises occurs and no other people group on the planet because Israel was continually uh, idolatrous. Israel was continuously wayward. Israel was continuously adulterous. Israel never obeyed God. I mean, as a people in whole, they never obeyed God. So then they, you should not see an Israel that's thriving in the world. You should see an Israel that is under the foot of somebody. You should see an Israel in the world who has had their minds and wills and psychology broken. You should see an Israel who is under authority and lives in fear for their very lives every time they leave their house. That's the Israel you should identify in the earth. And there's only mm. one people group that meets that criteria. This is why it matters. Mm. Mm. So, Calandria, do you, uh, I mean, I mean, I appreciate your, I really do appreciate your feedback because this type of stuff we have to think through as we present this, you know, are you, um, it, you know, why does it matter, right? And that's the same question I asked. Remember, I was like, yeah. I don't, why? Why yeah. does it matter? But and, you know, part of the part of the asking of the question why, when you read the pages of this of this book, the reason why we even broach the ask, well, why does that matter, or submit to or yield to the idea of why does it matter? It's because we have a broken psychology. We have a broken psychology. That's what I'm going to say. It goes back to, you remember the Botham gene, the, the guy that got killed in his apartment yep. eating ice cream? You remember yep. that? Y'all yep. want to know the y'all want to know one of the worst days of my life? You want to know one of the worst days of my life? What's that? Is, is, when, is when she was found guilty and her his brother said, can I give her a hug? <laughs> And, 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 and I'm a pastor and I love, I, I promise you, I love, I do love everybody. Can I give her a hug? It, for me, that was a broken psychology moment because she would not have given him a hug. The, this weekend, this past weekend was the hundredth anniversary of the burning down of a place in Tulsa called Greenwood. 36,000 people uh, were displaced it was a community that had their own hospitals, yeah. banks, Wall grocery Street. stores, and schools. Airport. They were completely self-sufficient. And because of a misunderstanding, a lie, or whatever you want to call it, uh, a group of angry white people came through and burned down that section of the country. Not and only that, it. the federal Bound government, the federal government oh, dropped put, the bomb on them. Put, put, yeah, yes. they did. Small planes came through Bound it, it. And, dropped, uh, and dropped ordinance mm -hmm. on it. The federal government put roads through that community. Uh, there is an international airport on that very same community. But this weekend, they want the citizens and the survivors, three survivors of the, of the event, they want those people to be satisfied with a marble monument with the flame on top. Come down, let's celebrate, and let's say kumbaya. Yeah. But not only did they do that there, they did it in Memphis and Florida, Maryland. I mean... Uh, 
it's I, almost they were saying that every time they were successful um um areas where they were thriving and so forth they came in and they, they destroyed, destroyed it but you, you this is why this is the, the, I'm not saying to harbor any hate, ill feelings, discontent. I'm not saying that at all. But as the saying goes, if you don't know history, you're doomed to repeat it. We need mm -hmm. to understand what happened, to whom it happened, right. and what God says the remedy for it happening in the future is. Well, and tell the, tell the Jewish people today that their identity doesn't matter. That it, they, they, everything about they believe that apart from who they are as Jews that you know they can't separate that right it's it's so it do, it matters and I just think we gotta I know it's gonna be a fight for many um because I go to these churches and I see these uh, at black churches and I see all these images of uh, all these white biblical characters around. And we, that's what we've been conditioned to believe. I mean, for that matter, I had a, I had a white Jesus on my wall growing up as a little boy and, um, and little white sheep and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and that was not an accurate depiction. I often wonder what would I what would my life have been like if I would have been exposed to, to accurate imagery early? Right. Um, how would I have related to white people? Would I've had that fear growing up in, uh, see, I grew up in around all black people probably had maybe one white kid at our school. And so I had anxiety when it came down to how do I engage initially? How do I engage, you know, other people, right? Would I have, would I have had that? I don't know. I mean, so anyway, that's my rambling. Yeah. Hey, Lewis, I just sent you on Facebook Messenger. I, I think y'all need to read this Willie Lynch thing in its entirety. Yeah, this I have the whole thing. I, I'll, put it, yeah. I'll put it on there. I'll put it on there on the group. Andy Lewis. Yeah, I'll put it on the group. Um, <laughs> it is horrifying. <laughs> but, you have to read it. <laughs> but, but when you read this, you'll understand why. What are the questions that I that I asked and answered myself this weekend was why do our women uh, 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 allow these uh, unjobbed, no money having men to lay up in bed all day, sponge off of them. But, it, and, and that, that, that question uh, is answered in, in these documents. There's a section called the breaking of the African woman. Boom. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I haven't even, I've just been speed reading through paragraphs, but I can't read any more of this tonight. This is, this is freaking me out. <laughs> Seriously, I, I, I've never read anything it's like that. It's powerful when you read it because then you're yeah. going to be like, that, yeah, I, because you're going to be able to identify with the happenings of it. Yeah, I've read that before. Have you? It's, I've it's, it's, I've read bits and pieces a long time ago, but it's, it's sad. It's really sad. Yeah. I'll, I'll say his last name is Lynch. I mean, Lynch. I know. That sounds horrible. I mean, that's what that's what they did. They lynched people. All right, okay. guys, it's 838, 839. Thank you so much for your time tonight. You guys. Um, really right. appreciate it. Uh, I'll close this in prayer, and then we are done. <laughs>